Welcome to Atmos 5000, Day 22. Our objectives today are being pulled from Stull Chapter 14, Sections 14.1 and 14.2. We're going to be doing a lot of qualitative stuff today, mostly focusing in on the stages of thunderstorm formation, the different types of thunderstorms that are out there, and the types of weather that are associated with these different types of thunderstorms. So one thing that all thunderstorms have in common is that they have three basic ingredients. And the mnemonic that we use is LIM, L-I-M. The first is lift, which is a mechanism to trigger the updraft. And then we need instability, which is typically a conditionally unstable environmental lapse rate. And then we need moisture, because moisture provides the energy for these systems. And if the environment is missing one of these three basic ingredients, then there will be no chance for a thunderstorm on that particular day. We have to have all three. So the basic thunderstorm types can be divided up into four groups, uh, starting from the smallest and moving to the largest. We have air mass thunderstorms, uh, typically about 10 kilometers wide and a duration of one to two hours. We have multi-cell thunderstorms, sometimes called frontal squall lines, uh, tend to be bigger uh, with a width of 10 to 50 kilometers and will typically last two to four hours. We have supercell thunderstorms, uh, which are basically are about 25 to 100 kilometers and last two to six hours. And then we have one that you may have not have heard of, which are mesoscale convective systems. Um, and MCS is a much larger uh, type of thunderstorm. It's greater than 100 kilometers and it's much more long-lived. It can last anywhere from 12 to 36 hours. So let's talk about air mass thunderstorms first. These air mass thunderstorms form an environment with almost no vertical wind shear. So that means that the winds are not changing direction or speed with height, and this allows those storms to grow straight up. And they have uh, the most common type of lifting mechanism associated with these thunderstorms, is surface heating, and they are often occur uh, in the tropics and uh, can also occur in the warm sector of an extratropical cyclone. So here we have a uh, weather front. So we have a low pressure system in southern Kansas. We have a warm front that goes off to the southeast, and then we have a cold front which is going off to the southwest. Um, the warm front is the red one, the cold front is the blue one. And then we happen to have a dry line on this one as well, which is the dashed tan line, and that extends from the low pressure as well. The warm sector of the extratropical cyclone, which is what this is, is this maritime tropical air mass between the surface warm front and the dry front. Um, you'll very often have these because this is more of a tropical air mass. And so you get these tropical type clouds that uh, extend up into middle latitudes um, <clears throat> on this side of the extratropical cyclone. So let's talk about the life cycle of an air mass thunderstorm. So what we're looking at here is kind of a time representation of an individual air mass thunderstorm. So it starts off in the cumulus stage where the only vertical motions inside the cloud are essentially updrafts. Um, the cloud is uh, growing there and it has super cooled uh, droplets in it because it extends up above the zero degree Celsius line. Later on, at some time in the future, uh, it will become mature. And we define the mature phase of the air mass thunderstorm as when precipitation starts to fall. When precipitation is first uh, uh, seen coming out of the base of the thunderstorm. Typically speaking, uh, that occurs after we've had ice formation in the cloud and uh, typically happens uh, through the uh, uh, wagner uh, bergeron Findeisen process that we've discussed before. It doesn't have to have ice, 
But uh, as we said, most of these uh, thunderstorms, at least over continental regions, will definitely reach up into the cold regions of the troposphere where ice can form. The last section or the last stage of the air mass thunderstorm is the dissipation stage. And now the dissipation stage is when all of the vertical motions inside the cloud are essentially on the way down. Um, the cloud will start to evaporate, will often leave a residual cloud uh, up above that uh, you know, part of the anvil cloud will remain from these clouds when the lower part of the cloud uh, rains away essentially. And one of the reasons why these air mass thunderstorms don't last very long is because, the, uh, because they're vertically oriented. When it starts to precipitate, the downdrafts are coming down right on top of the updrafts. And so that limits the overall cloud lifetime. So what types of weather are associated with these air mass thunderstorms? Well, because it's a thunderstorm, you can have lightning. And in order to have lightning, you have to have ice in the cloud. So these air mass thunderstorms have typically short duration, uh, not particularly long, you know, less than an hour or two. Uh, you can get rain showers during that time period, and it can possibly be heavy rain showers. We can have a weak to moderate gust front. So when the cold air from the precipitating cloud uh, starts to descend, it accelerates down towards the ground. When it hits the ground, it spreads out in all directions. Uh, and that can generate a gust front, which is essentially that cold, moist air coming down from the cloud that hits the ground and then spreads out. These air mass thunderstorms uh, do not typically produce hail, and they do not typically produce tornadoes. So next, if we want to have a multi-cell thunderstorm, we still have to have lift, instability, and moisture, but we have to have two additional uh, ingredients, essentially. We have to have boundaries, which is basically a mechanism to initiate additional lift, and we need to have shear, wind shear, in this case, a change in the horizontal wind with height. And this wind shear needs to be occurring typically in the lower half of the troposphere. So the mnemonic that we use for this, for multi-cell thunderstorm, is that you have to have limbs. Lift, instabil instability, moisture, boundary, and shear. So let's take a look at the wind shear here. Um, we have our vertical wind barbs between the surface and 6 kilometers. At the surface, the winds are from the south-southeast at 10 knots and then it switches gradually to a westerly flow and eventually reaches uh, 60 knots from the uh, west-northwest uh, by the time we hit six kilometers. This wind shear, in this case, has both directional shear and speed shear, and it's basically caused by the large-scale environmental conditions. So here, on the left, we have a representation of the wind shear, in this case showing speed shear, where the wind speed is increasing in magnitude with height. And then we have a time series of cumulus cells. So up on the initial time period, on the top of this, we essentially have three different cells. Uh, we have the original cell, which has grown from the cumulus stage to the mature stage, to the dissipating stage. And uh, on the upwind side of this cloud, a secondary cell, cell number two, has grown. And it has gone through the cumulus stage and is now in the um, mature stage. And then on the upwind side of that, we have the third cumulus cell, which is growing on the upwind side. And that's in the cumulus stage, the growth phase. And what's happening is that instead of having all of the phases of the thunderstorm development, the cumulus, the mature, and the dissipating occurring in one physical location, the wind shear causes the different phases of the cloud to be physically separated so that uh, the older cells are on the downwind side of the cloud and the younger cells are on the upwind side. So if we take that a little bit further in time, 
say to the middle panel here, 10 minutes later, uh, the dissipating cell number one is pretty much gone. Cell number two is now in the dissipating phase. Cell three is now in the uh, mature phase. And there's a new cell four in the cumulus stage. And tw uh, 20 minutes uh, later, now cell three is in the uh, dissipating phase. Cell four is in the uh, mature phase. So it's physical separation of these individual cells uh, which allow the updrafts and the downdrafts to persist simultaneously inside the cloud. But in order for this to happen, the cloud, overall cloud, has to be much bigger than an air mass thunderstorm so that you can physically separate the updrafts and the downdrafts. And all of this is being driven by the wind shear. So here we have the evolution of a multi-cell thunderstorm. and it's essentially repeating. So the white area is kind of denoting the boundaries of the cloud. The red dots are representing the updraft, and the green dots are essentially showing air that's being entrained into the cloud uh, and then getting caught up in the downdraft. The blues, greens, and reds are actually showing the uh, location of the precipitation. And then at the very bottom, you'll notice there's this little line that moves to the right from the cloud, and that is actually the gust front, which is the cold air that's moving away from the thunderstorm itself. So you can see that as this cloud is growing up, it's getting tilted to the left. And the reason it's being tilted to the left in this example is that the wind speed is increasing with height, but it's coming from the right to the left across this domain. So it tilts the cloud uh, to the left as you move up with height sort of thing. So let's now focus in on the precipitation shafts. Initially, <clears throat> the downdraft uh, is uh, associated with that precipitation, but the gust front is causing the updraft to move away from the downdraft. And you can see that those red uh, tracers are essentially still rising, even though you have the downdraft, because they're getting <clears throat> shifted away from where the downdraft is at. And you can see subsequent cells uh, growing and dissipating. There's cell number one, cell number two, cell number three, four, five, six, sort of thing. So it's just kind of a graphical representation of how a multi-cell thunderstorm actually operates. So you can tell that shear is extremely important in the formation of these multi-cell thunderstorms. It separates the updrafts and the downdrafts, and without that shear, uh, the downdrafts uh, would destroy the precipit would destroy the updrafts just like they do in the air mass thunderstorm. And the other thing to note is that for a given amount of convective available potential energy, the strength and the longevity of a severe thunderstorm tends to increase with increasing depth and strength of the vertical wind shear. So if we have a certain amount of energy, the more wind shear we have, the longer and more severe the thunderstorm will actually be. So, here we have a classic uh, multi-cell severe thunderstorm, uh, and it has several different features in it. So here, once again, we have wind that's increasing with height uh, from the uh, right to the left across the page. So we have our updraft on the right, which is being driven by the outflow, uh, the gust front. Um, that is driving the updraft. We have an updraft that uh, is pretty much undilute going up in the center of the storm. And that air is accelerating above the level of free convection. So it's accelerating upwards until it hits the tropopause. And at the tropopause, it has uh, so much velocity that it actually overshoots into the base of the stratosphere before spreading out along the tropopause. We, the 
the cloud that spreads out along the tropopause is known as an anvil cloud, and it typically has mammatus clouds hanging underneath. The precipitation uh, is heaviest, uh, kind of underneath the overshooting cloud top, um, and but you have light rain uh, that continues far from that convective region in the older portions of the cloud and the trailing stratiform region where you do in fact have continued light precipitation for some time. The entrainment of air uh, will accentuate the downdraft. We often get what we call a rear inflow jet where the cloud uh, precipitation is pulling air down with it uh, and it will pull air in from the back side of the cloud through this rear inflow jet. It's dry air so it helps uh, evaporate the precipitation. And as the precipitation is evaporating, it gets colder, which causes it to sink even faster. The multi-cell thunderstorms, of course, have lightning because all thunderstorms do. They basically provide rain showers that are likely to be heavy, and these will be of moderate duration. They can last for a few hours. You typically have a, a moderate to strong gust front because you now have this precipitation that is cooling the atmosphere and bringing in the air, the dry air from the rear uh, inflow jet, causing a stronger gust front. You can sometimes have small hail and you can, gen you can also generate tornadoes are possible, although the tornadoes associated with these multi-cell thunderstorms are generally pretty weak. So now let's talk about the ingredients for a supercell thunderstorm. Well, we still need lift, instability, moisture, boundaries, and shear. We still, still need limbs in order for a supercell thunderstorm to form. But now we have two additional uh, ingredients or required elements. And that would be a capping inversion. So if you think about what an inversion does, it changes the stability of the atmosphere. And if we have a capping inversion in the lower part of the atmosphere, it will cap or limit the vertical growth uh, in the early part of the day. And later on in the afternoon, when the air parcels finally break through that capping inversion, they can make it to the level of free convection and they will basically explode upward. Uh, it also helps to have a dry layer aloft uh, and this dry layer often coincides with the capping inversion, and it serves the same purpose as the capping inversion in that it limits the vertical growth until late in the afternoon when you have all of this pent up uh, moisture and all of this energy that just is waiting to be uh, extracted from the atmosphere. So supercell thunderstorm. Uh, basically has most of the features of a classic multi-cell thunderstorm, uh, but it has some additional ones as well. So in this case, we have winds that are increasing with height uh, from the left to the right. So this is different than the presentation that we had for the multi-cell thunderstorms. <clears throat> the key features that are different for a supercell thunderstorm um, is the fact that we have a wall cloud uh, at the base of the updraft. And this wall cloud is part of a rotating mesocyclone, um, which is essentially a visible rotation at the base of the cloud. Uh, other features uh, that we have um, underneath the precipitation part, um, there's so much precipitation coming down that it humidifies the lower part of the atmosphere and literally changes the cloud base. And you can have what we call a shelf cloud extending down below the cloud base due to the precipitation. Um, you can have a flanking line, which is an area of uh, inflow into the cloud. Um, and it's very, um, it's kind of the beginning of the cumulus stage, but it's uh, physically separated from the strong updraft initially. And then the other feature associated with the supercell thunderstorm that you can see here is that you might have a uh, tornado down at the bottom. You can also have large hail uh, from this type of thunderstorm as well. So the features, uh, the anvil cloud, the mammatus clouds, just like the uh, multi-cell thunderstorms. The mesocyclone is a key difference. 
which is that rotation in the bottom of the cloud. We have the bounded weak echo region, the BWER. What this means is a weak echo with regards to the weather radar. The weather radar sends out a pulse of microwave radiation that bounces off of the hydrometeors uh, and then uh, returns to the receiver and is interpreted as precipitation. Well, in these supercell thunderstorms, the updrafts are so strong, greater than 10 meters per second, that they literally push all of the uh, water, all of the hydrometeors, all of the rain droplets out of the area of the updraft. And so the area where you have your strongest updrafts uh, basically don't have any precipitation in them, and they show up as an area with no precipitation on the radar. And we refer to that as the bounded weak echo region. The BWER is the center of the supercell thunderstorm. And underneath that center, you will, underneath the bounded weak echo region, you'll find the mesocyclone and the wall cloud. And then we also have that rear flanking line, which is where we have inflow in coming into the cloud. So the anvil cloud uh, is easy to spot. Uh, it spreads out at the base of the uh, stratosphere at the tropopause. It's uh, generally uh, composed of ice so that it has fuzzy edges and will often have mammatus clouds hanging underneath of it. So here's an example of mammatus clouds that are being lit up uh, at sunset, so the, the sun is underneath the uh, anvil cloud and shining up on it. It's a pretty dramatic uh, uh, view of Mamatis clouds. That mesocyclone that we've been talking about is a rotating base of the cumulonimbus cloud, and this rotation can actually be identified using Doppler radar. Uh, Doppler radar is a special kind of radar that can tell whether or not the hydrometeors that are being detected are moving toward or away from the radar using the Doppler effect. Uh, the wall cloud typically forms underneath the base of the mesocyclone, and this is by far the most likely region of a supercell thunderstorm to produce a tornado, although it's not the only place where tornadoes could occur in these storms. So here we have the Doppler radar display for <clears throat> a thunderstorm situation in Oklahoma City in May 4th of 1999. This happened to be a day that there was a significant tornado outbreak. For reference purposes, in the middle part of the screen on the right, um, we have this kind of black circle with the letters K-T-A-L-X um, inside that circle. And that is the location of the radar. And the red colors in this case are wind that is moving towards the radar. <clears throat> and the green colors are uh, wind that is moving away from the radar. So uh, we have winds essentially kind of coming from the southwest and moving up to the northeast. But superimposed out in this field of red, you have this couplet, this green-red couplet. And that can only occur if you have a situation where you have rotation. Um, so you have an area that is uh, moving away from the radar right next to an area that's moving um, toward the radar. And the computer algorithm that they use has identified this as a mesocyclone. So what we're looking at is the mesocyclone at the base of the rotation of the uh, strong updraft in the cumulonimbus cloud. This uh, computer algorithm has also identified this as a possible location for a tornado. And it's been tracking the location of the mesocyclone for about the last 20 minutes. Uh, it was moving from the southwest to the northeast. And based upon that motion, the computer algorithm is actually predicting where that mesocyclone is going to go. And if there happens to be a tornado associated with this mesocyclone, the computer algorithm is essentially predicting where that tornado is likely to be on the ground so that they can warn the people uh, to take shelter. The bounded weak echo region 
is that region above the mesocyclone that doesn't contain any precipitation because the updrafts are so strong that the updrafts are stronger than the maximum fall velocity of the rain droplets. Recall that the maximum rain droplet velocity is about a little over nine meters per second. So if you have updrafts in excess of 10 meters per second, they literally push the rain up and out of the updraft. And that is really what we define as the center of the supercell thunderstorm. So now we are looking at a supercell thunderstorm from the top. Imagine that you're in a drone, a very high altitude drone, looking down on a supercell thunderstorm. The vault at the center of this is the bounded weak echo region. Uh, uh, where you basically don't have any precipitation. Uh, you can see the, uh, the blue hatched areas are places where you're essentially going to have rain. And if you're going to have hail, then it's typically going to happen just adjacent to the bounded weak echo region. And when we uh, go into the details of hail formation, it'll be apparent why the hail uh, grows in this region. Uh, you'll also see that the rain kind of wraps around the bounded weak echo region labeled as the vault here. And it provides a very distinctive, what we refer to as a hook echo on the precipitation radar. And so here is the precipitation radar for that same supercell thunderstorm that we were looking at in Oklahoma. So we still have the radar on the center right, KTLX, and now uh, the red colors in this case are extremely heavy precipitation. And you'll notice that this supercell thunderstorm has a large area of um, you know, fairly high precipitation, and then it wraps around uh, in the shape of a hook. Uh, and the place where this white arrow is pointing at that is the bounded weak echo region of the cloud where there's no precipitation, but that is actually the center of the supercell thunderstorm, and it's the place where the updrafts are strongest, and the precipitation is getting wrapped around that rotation and giving it the, cor the um, corresponding hook echo that is so commonly associated with these supercell thunderstorms. Here we have an example of a wall cloud. So we have a very large cumulonimbus cloud, nimbus cloud above us. Uh, the cloud is dark. Why is the cloud dark and looks so ominous? Because the cumulonimbus cloud is so deep that most of the sunlight is getting attenuated before it gets down here. And so these clouds are essentially in the shadow of the larger clouds, which are up above. And you'll notice that this wall cloud hangs down even lower than the cloud base. And if you stand here and watch that wall cloud, you would actually start to see that it's part of a rotating complex at the base of this cumulonimbus cloud. So here we have a different uh, supercell thunderstorm, but this is the precipitation mode. And you can see that it has the characteristic hook echo. In this case, we've kind of taken away all of the, the extraneous things except for the precipitation returns. Uh, so we have our characteristic hook echo, but on the southwestern, kind of on the western side of the hook echo, you'll see that there's a line of uh, precipitation uh, extending out from the hook. And that is our rear flanking line where we essentially have kind of outflow from this thunderstorm that is generating an updraft um, that is generating light precipitation as this air is actually flowing into the supercell thunderstorm. What types of weather are associated with these supercell thunderstorms? Well, lightning because it's a thunderstorm, very heavy rain showers, a very strong gust front, uh, hail is likely, and possibly large, and by large hail, we're talking about things that are the size of golf balls or tennis balls or baseballs or possibly even softballs. Uh, tornadoes are likely with a supercell thunderstorm, 
and the tornadoes that form have the potential to be uh, very strong and very damaging and very deadly. And lastly, we have a mesoscale convective system, an MCS. Uh, what we're looking at here is a uh, satellite image of a thunderstorm complex, and we're looking at the infrared temperature uh, from the top of the cloud. So the white and the green in the center of this are the coldest temperatures on this particular cloud, showing where the cloud tops are actually the highest. And this mesoscale convective system, as you can see, covers up about half of the state of Oklahoma. It would cover up most of the state of Arkansas if it moved just to the east. These are very large systems, much bigger than what you would think of as an individual cloud, yet there's an organized structure to these that allows them to persist anywhere from 12 to 36 hours. So the characteristics, it's a very large system, typically the size of a state. It will have a leading edge bow echo or gust front uh, along one side of the leading edge of the mesoscale convective system. And in that way, the leading edge is like a series of uh, multi-cell thunderstorms. Uh, but the trailing stratiform region is extremely wide um, and can generate uh, persistent and steady rainfall for hours on end. And it's these mesoscale convective systems that happen to be responsible for most of the summertime precipitation in the Midwestern United States. Weather associated with the MCS. Uh, typically speaking, the bowline echo, the squall line thunderstorms are very severe and they can have heavy precipitation. There's a large area of weak to moderate precipitation. That's the stratiform region and that will uh, rain for hours. You can have a strong straight line winds associated with the gust front on the leading edge of the mesoscale convective system. They can produce grapple which is, or small hail is possible associated with the MCS. And they can also produce weak or short-lived tornadoes about the same frequency and type as associated with the multi-cell thunderstorms. 